Any more? What's going on, man? Nothing much. How you doing? Okay, can you hear me? Oh yeah. All right, perfect, perfect. Yeah, it's like night and day. That's awesome. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's it's a huge difference because at first when I was when I was doing the Zoom shows, I was just standing in front of my laptop, and um, but you know with Zoom stuff, if somebody laughs, their audio might cut out a little bit. Yep. So with this, it's like you hear me much more clear. And also, um, it doesn't take away from my set. Oh, my God. That's probably the most annoying thing. Even with, like, one-on-one interviews, you say something, someone giggles, or someone, like, cuts in for a second, and then immediately goes to their audio. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I can only imagine, yeah. man. That must have been so, so, again, like, different for you. Like, was it, like, were you getting used to it by the end of it? Like, by the time that you were getting to do sets in front of live audiences again, were you like, oh, man, I kind of liked it? Or were you yeah. No, no. I mean, even now, like, I would definitely still do one. Um, I think the last one I did was in November. I did one in November for a school in New Hampshire for their alumni weekend. And it just definitely, it pulled the whole different skill out of me because, um, I mean, just not having that live interaction. It's a, it's a totally different type of energy. I had to learn how to pace myself differently um, and just getting comfortable performing in this empty room, still making it feel like I'm actually there with people. So it, just, it definitely taught me a lot about myself. At first, I was against it. I didn't want to do it at all. And then um, it legit was the money that made me do it. <laughs> like, like it was literally because I wasn't performing like f- without the pandemic, like well, with the pandemic happening, I wasn't doing any shows. And where I was at when the pandemic hit, I was in Brooklyn. So it was like the news. They had us terrified to go outside up here. <laughs> so I wasn't going out at all. And I was just fine with having that break of not worrying about getting booked on comedy shows. So. I went months, <clears throat> I went months without performing, and then my college agent hit me up um, in late August. He was like, hey, I got a school that wants to book you. And throughout the summer, they were sending me emails asking, hey, do you want to do any virtual showcase? And I was just ignoring them all. Like, I was like, no, I'm not performing virtually. And then, so when he called me, he was like, yeah, you know, they, the shows, they pay the same as live. So when he told me that, I was like, all right, I'll think about it. And then once I ended up doing my first one, I had so much fun. It was like, it, I got hooked. I was like, I, I wish I would have tried harder to do this, like, more. But I, I definitely picked up a good amount of um, virtual shows. Um, I say in 2021, I probably did a little over 30. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it's almost like starting over a little bit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's like when you first started out you were getting you know some hits but mostly bombing and you're just right. having to go through that shithole and then you right, know eventually yeah. you get to the point where everybody's on board with what you're doing but that had to be like very difficult starting out especially like mic work knowing how to you know connect to so many different people on zoom like how many people mm-hmm. at a time were on these calls um it varies it, it definitely varies so like the first the first one i did was for ohio state and, um, you know, Ohio State, huge university, right. where it's like, it's, it's basically its own town. But doing the Zoom show for them, it was maybe a, a, a few hundred kids on. But even that, that was like, that's one of the more successful ones because of how many students it is. Like, and when you think about the alternatives that you're competing with for Zoom comedy, you have... I mean, just all the streaming sites like Hulu, Netflix, or things like that, just regular TV. You got video games, um, regular nightlife. So you <clears throat> so you're competing with so much as a Zoom show to try to get these people to come in. So I've had like really successful ones like that one where I had a few hundred students, but then I've had shows where it was just me and maybe like four other people on. And I still just have to do my time. <laughs> Jeez, man. Jeez. Right. How do you rate it, you know, like starting off, you know, just to like get right into it. This, if you guys don't know who this is, Anthony Moore, yeah. uh, all that and more on Instagram and mm-hmm. social media. 
Uh, how do you compare that to, you know, starting out in comedy back, you know, 10, 15 years ago to what you had to do during COVID in 2020 and 2021? Um, man, I, this was the last thing I would have imagined. Like, I used to always say, like, when people ask me, do I have a backup plan for comedy? I used to always say, people will never stop wanting to laugh. Yeah. Like, because you just never you never imagine a pandemic happening. <laughs> like we never saw this day coming at all. So like with, when things shut down, um, I just didn't know what I was going to do. But now that I've done it, I like it a lot because um, it, it puts the power back in our hands where we don't need, we don't need clubs or, or venues or just these. Um, I mean, they, they help, but, if you could build your own base, you could just touch your fans directly. So that was one of the things I did after doing the doing the, the shows for colleges. I eventually um, put together my own Zoom show where I set up an event, bright charge um, tickets for the link. And I had a great turnout for it. And then I got the workout material. But then these were also people that wanted to see me for a while but they might just be in different states so like i had people from um north carolina or tennessee or just other places down south or on the on the west coast or just places i haven't reached yet they were able to see me in, in this um in, ty- in this type of space yeah so you turn it around you know you look yeah. at the positive side of things you're reaching a right. wider base audience around the globe as opposed to mm-hmm. just being in new york is that where you started you know, obviously growing up there no. in New York City. No, no, no. I started, Um, I started, I'm originally from Philly. I'm from okay. Philadelphia. So that's why I started in Philly, um, performed in a local scene there. But um, Philly is, is kind of like most cities where the it's a comedy club. It's a comedy club there, but it's not um a major comedy haven such as New York or LA. Right. So... Where in in Philly, now at the time when I moved, we only had one comedy club. Now we have two, but even then, it's like you're lucky to get on stage once, maybe twice a night. Um, where in New York, I could get up so much where I could get up easily, easily three to five times a night on stage. Jeez. And was it more like it was like a comedy club as opposed to like a bar where, you know, like half the people are going to pay attention at an open mic? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, like in like in Philly at the comedy clubs, they're they're more um, headliner clubs. So it was like where's like a regular headliner feature host. Um, But throughout the week, they have like an open mic night. So if you're a local comedian, you might get on at that that open mic night and then the rest of the week you're just going to be spending your time doing the open mics at the different bars where in new york is so many different clubs and just places where you could just get good stage time and it just helps you grow at such a rapid pace at what age did you do your uh, first open mic um when i was 18 18 yeah. really yeah yeah i started my my freshman year um a college my friends ended up talking me into hosting a school talent show and then from there I just liked the feeling of being on stage so right after that I just started going to different open mics around the city man so that's like literally like as you become an adult like that's something you wanted to pursue stand-up comedy um or did you like have really, other, other things that you had in mind yeah yeah like when I was in school so I went to a school my major was accounting um I, I that, that was what I wanted to be like me and one of my best friends from high school, we always talked like when we were in high school, we had this, um, one of, one of the electives we had was in business accounting class. And we just both loved this class. So we took it our junior and senior years and we talked about like making this a career. Like, like we could eventually like become CPAs and then open our own firm and things like that. So that was my plan. And 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 it was just because it wasn't my passion. It was just because I I I'm good with numbers and I knew accountants made good money. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. So yeah, so it was like I was just looking for some some type of stability. Um whereas 
when I got in, when, once I started college, um, after that talent show, it was like, that just became my passion. And it's funny because like my friend, the, my friend that I went to, um, like we went to the same college also after graduating. Like she's a, a great accountant right now. And um, it, it, it feels good. Like for me, it's like, I'm finally making money. <laughs> Where it's like, people don't understand how much time this, this takes to like really um, get consistent work in this. I mean, how long would you say, because I'm always fascinated to hear different uh, stand-up comedians, you know, stories mm-hmm. of making it, you know, your, your, you know, own ideology of making it, right? Yeah. And some people, it's like 20 years before they finally get that, like, okay, nod, like, I think I've made it. So right. It takes, like, I feel like that's not the norm. But then, right, yeah. like anything else in life, it, that happens to some people. You kind of have to just go through it. At what point did you realize, like, this is something I'm going to make a career of when you started monetizing? Like, how, <laughs> how deep into it was it? Um, honestly, like, I literally, I've been doing comedy. I started 2011. Started, yeah, I started March 2011. Um, and I literally just quit my job two weeks before the pandemic so like even though like i I was even though i i've gotten tv credits or worked at certain comedy clubs or things like that it was just comedy money is so inconsistent yeah whereas like this month you might make five thousand dollars off of comedy then the next month you you might be lucky to scratch a hundred dollars so it was just so inconsistent where so I stayed, I was working at a school and what made me take that leap to quit, I was um I started I started just performing at colleges. So so for colleges, that's where up and coming entertainers, um, like a lot of up and coming um comedians or musicians are performing at colleges because it's a great way to build your base. But then also colleges, they have the biggest budgets for for no name act so i started um i started performing at a lot of diff- different colleges um i got with a college agency in 2019 started booking me a good amount of school so i was starting to call out of work so much in 2020 that my job was just getting fed up with me calling out so march 3rd march 3rd 2020 that was my last day um well march 2nd was my last day working march 3rd i had a show at a school in minnesota and i knew if i called out they were going to fire me Mm -hmm. so i was like i was just hoping that um one of my co-workers i was hoping that a student that he worked with didn't show up that day so he could just substitute and watch my student for me but that plan didn't work out so (laughs) so like the school they called me like yo where are you at like you're supposed to be at work right now. And when they called me, I was sitting in LaGuardia Airport. <laughs> like I was like, yeah, I'm sorry, but I I won't be in today. And um that was literally so <laughs> they let me go and I was scared, but also I had things lined up for the end of March. But then <laughs> a week later, the pandemic hit. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. So, Double-edged sword, man. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's definitely one of, like, those roads. It's like you got two roads. Which one are you going to take? And you're going to choose the passion thing over anything. Right. Else. That's what you want to pursue at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. That, yeah, that's bad timing. That That's unfortunate. Mm-hmm. But, you, yeah. again, like, you look back at that, it's a great story. Like, going, yeah. you know, further into that, like, obviously, you were probably a little anxious, a little nervous as soon as, mm-hmm. you know, the whole pandemic happened. But what happened, you know, in the leading months as you're, like, booking these virtual uh, sets and everything? Right, yeah. So. So yeah, I was um really nervous about um like what am I going to do? How am I going to make money? How am I going to make rent? Um so like because I worked at a school, I was able to get unemployment for the time being, but even with that, I knew eventually that was going to run its course. So I'm still thinking like what am I going to do? Like and how am I going to make my transition back into comedy? So then from <clears throat> I I had shows 
my last shows was that that last weekend of of March 2020. So I want to say March. I was booked at Philly March 12th to the 14th, and it was so crazy because every night those shows like the the restrictions were changing. It was like we were learning new things every day. So it went from being I remember that Thursday night, um, on March 12th, 2020. Like after the show, me and my friends, we all went out to a bar. Like, like everything was normal. And then the next day they were like, yeah, we have to cap this at only 150 people allowed in. Then the next night it was like only a hundred people allowed in. Then by Monday it was just no, no groups bigger than 10. So I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. So I went from March to the end of August, not performing. Um, I ended up booking a school, I ended up performing at some school in like upstate New York. And that was my first time being back on stage. And it's crazy because with colleges, when you perform, you're, you're booked to perform for an hour. So I'm already super rusty. I would have been rusty doing five minutes on stage, but to have to go up there and do an hour and <laughs> like, um, like just fighting trying to remember anything of my set um and that was like one of my last um I want to say live like performances like I was lucky to even get that to be live um and then after that the rest of the year the rest of 2020 and the well yeah the rest of 2020 and mostly 2021 everything was virtual I I was fortunate to have some live stuff, but that was in like the more middle America states. Like um I traveled to South Dakota, Kansas, um, where else? Indiana a few times. So but everything mostly east coast to west coast, that was just virtual. Did you have to, you know, to put it in layman's terms, is just to, you know, choose your words wisely when performing in front of colleges? Especially um, if you have like an hour worth no. of material. That's what I was surprised about. Like, I've really, I've really been fortunate enough to where these schools have been letting me do whatever. So, because I always hear, you always hear, like, especially with older comics, they say, like, how they're tired of cancel culture and um, this new generation is so sensitive. But what I realized is, like, college kids, I hear so many things about, like, older comedians complaining about um, cancel culture and this new generation is super sensitive. But what I realized is like, I was a college kid once once before. It's like, these students, they just want to have fun, drink. Um, like, they just looking to do all the things that like we, we used to do. It's like, nothing has changed. And it's all about just relating to them. So I was, I, I was, I had a ball performing at these colleges because it's literally just, um, just about bringing them into your world. I think the problem is, I feel like a, a, a problem that um comedians have when it comes to performing for these crowds, like when it comes to changing your material, comedians feel like you're pandering. And it's like, you're really not pandering. It's more so just like making sure you're not being super offensive in a way of like, like you would have different language if you're hanging with your friends versus around like versus you visiting your grandmother for Thanksgiving. Right. <laughs> it's like you is it, so it's like just being mindful of just certain words that might trigger people. But other than that, no, I've been having a great time. What do you think was like the closest time where you felt like you were on the edge of being insanely offensive? To where like you kind of <laughs> felt the vibe um, from the crowd. Like oh, a few people like that, others didn't. Um hmm um i i want to say my maybe relationship relationship stuff um i feel like that might trigger somebody when i talk about um i just talk about um relationships or like my past um my past just just my past relationships i feel like um that might trigger people that might trigger something in them like if i speak about um because i i tell stories about how I was a horrible boyfriend in college or things like that. Right. So I feel like that's one thing that does like trigger 
the young woman. But other than that, I feel like everything is like really fine. I like it. Two things I, I try to stay away from, just like a normal conversation, is um religion and politics. Those right. are always the two things I stay away from at any comedy show. Cause that could that could go especially at a college. And a comedy club is one thing, but at colleges, it's like that could just like sway everything. And now I gotta deal with um the people that booked the show, backlash yeah. from them. So Honestly, like even the big now, like you just saw uh, Dave Chappelle's new special, The Closer, like got right, yeah. bad backlash from that from a lot of people. You right, know, he, he targeted all the stuff that you'd want yeah. to stay away from. <laughs> yeah, and that and 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 that that made me mad because when people got upset about that, it's like for me, if I don't like a like, I'm still a genuine fan of comedy. So it's plenty of times where I turned on a special. And then I turn it off just because I'm like, yeah, this this stinks. Or, like, I just don't find this funny. So it's like to go out your way. And Chappelle is a, what, he's, he's about six. I want to say he might, might have, like, six specials on Netflix right now. Something like that. Like, it's something crazy. So it's like, for him to be this deep in it, if you didn't like the first one, why do you continue to keep watching special after special to be offended? If you know this is the topic he's on. And and there's also, for him, like, what people getting tired of it, I feel like it's more so a reaction. Like, like the backlash, and then he reacts and has to say something about it. It's like, these jokes, they just, some some of these instances, instances are just right in themselves, where it's like, it's, it's too good to not talk about. Oh, my God. Like, do you find that very difficult? Like, even starting out with your own stuff, your own material, mm-hmm. is knowing that the crowd, some people might show up and be offended by some stuff, but in your head, you know, like as a comic, you're here to tell jokes and only, right, yeah. obviously we want to mix it in with like current topics and things that will relate right, to yeah. people, but you have to know coming in as a fan, as an audience member that they, they are telling jokes and that they're trying to make you laugh. They're not trying to offend you. Right. Yeah. I feel like, and I feel like that's the main thing is like, as long as it's all in, um, as long as it's all in the instance where you're not being malicious. Yeah. Like I'm all for, for me, it's about intent. I'm all for the intent of a joke. If it's just like, you're just making a joke, some jokes. And the only way you can know if a joke is funny is by doing it on stage. Everything sounds great when you do it in a mirror or write it down in your phone or in your notebook or things like that. But the only way to know is if a joke works is by going up there and actually doing it. So I'm sure you've seen like like Chappelle or Louis C.K. or um, I'm trying to think of another guy. It's like material is super risky. I guess like even like Chris Rock. So many things when they work it out, it sounds terrible. Like it just sounds it sounds evil, but it's just you have you have to go through that process to figure out the the correct wording of it. So I feel like that's the thing. And I feel like with Chappelle, I feel like um, it was just like, I feel like his intent, it may, it, it may come off offensive, but I don't think his intent is to offend. It's just like he's trying to just give his perspective and things like that. And then also with people getting offended, like sometimes people had to realize these people are just like, they're just old men. It's like it's like these are fifty year old men, like late forties or early fifty year old men, where it's like they they didn't they just came up a different way. Yep. I mean it's almost you have to pick a topic that you know is gonna get buzzed and at the same time word it to where people know it's a joke where you know right. like he knew going in, like this is gonna get right. backlash no matter how. Just in our generation with everything going on over the past 18 months like he knew right. that it was going to get some buzz <laughs> for good reasons and bad reasons right right I, mean, I, I grew up on bill burr being on the East right yeah yeah burr. i would not be offended by bill burr no like, you it's, don't know it's, what his is. it's funny because um <laughs> my my the college agency that i'm with is actually on um, bill burr's old college agents wow. and so when you perform for colleges they usually have like a showcase um they usually have a showcase like where they see which which acts they want to pick 
for their semester. And they said that I think at one showcase, Bird was killing, like just had everybody like just dying laughing, but he didn't get many bookings because they were scared of like this material might like scare some of the students away. But it's like, which is like, I don't know, it's it's just comedy is just so weird <laughs> in that in that instance. But it's like if it's funny, it's funny. That should all that should be the only thing that matters. Yeah, I mean it's so yeah. subjective. As right. You, like, did you did you were you ever you know doing you know sharing the stage with someone that was being malicious to the point where you're like, well, man, slow down, or like, was everybody of the general census like we're here to tell yeah. folks? Yeah, no, no, I've definitely seen like some. Um, I could I could give some instances of like malicious intent, like well, where's like just no punchline behind it. Right. It was this one comedian, this was, like, at a festival, like, recently. It was, like, a few months ago where it was, like, this one comedian went on stage after this Asian guy and was just, like, it was, like, just no punchline. He just came out just, like, right off the top, just, like, slur after slur. And it's like, it was just, I know the type of comic he is, but if he just... If it was like more of a creative setup or like punchline or anything to it, it just seemed like it was like no joke. It was like right. it just seemed like he would just come out there just being as wild as he could. So at that point, it's like, come on, now it's like is is you're just being hacky. Did it seem like they were good jokes? He just was not structuring them well. No, no, no. It was like it was literally no joke in it. <laughs> yeah. Just all like, the substance without the punchline. Right, yeah. Like in that that one side, it just came off like super mean but but other than that um but but then i've also seen instances where it's like somebody um where the the joke just didn't land right or they were just figuring it out so i i I definitely get both sides of the coin that's gotta be so (laughs) both awkward and fun to be around like looking right yeah (laughs) this is awful right we go to open mics, just some of me and my video guys from time to time and just watch people bomb, you know, yeah. set after set after set. <laughs> like, I don't think this is going to work out for you. Or you, you got to put a little bit more work into it, you know, figure right. out what yeah. you're doing wrong. Don't go up there and keep doing the same thing, you know? Right, yeah. Man, <laughs> that, that's so interesting. And then you get to the point where you're actually in a room with a bunch of, you know, great comics that you're learning from, right? You know, like right, yeah. the Morgans or the Jay Farrows or the Kevin Hart's I've seen, you know, getting to perform at the Comedy Cellar in New York City. Like that's right, got to yeah. be like an awesome thing to look back from 2011 to now, getting all the experiences that you've gotten done. Like, no, is that something that you like constantly look back at? Or are you one of those guys that's constantly moving forward? You don't think about the past too much. No, no, I definitely, I think about it all the time. Like it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. I would have never imagined. Um, I just would have never imagined things turning out this way. Like just, I remember me being this kid, stressed stressed trying to figure out when am i going to be booked for the next time or just um or just certain things just like regular life stuff to where now i'm booked on a consistent basis or i'm getting paid to fly out to this state like i'm going to places that i never would have imagined where it might not be the most famous place but just the fact that i'm getting paid the the travel and and do this like my job is literally making people laugh it's the wildest thing whereas like i like my day i wake up i work out i walk my dog and then I, i'm just home killing time until it's time for me to go perform so like like now i did some laundry wash dishes but it's like that's it, it it's it's the craziest concept whereas like i used to really stress like I was just talking to somebody about this the other day. I remember vividly stressing in um in math tutoring in high school. <laughs> like, like I remember being stressed my senior year. Like, man, I wish I could just fast forward. Like, I hope things are okay one day. Like, <laughs> and like so now to be able to doing this, it's the wildest thing. And even like the comedy seller, I for me when I got into comedy, I didn't know like um. 
the 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 prestige that the seller has. So when I when I got into comedy, my goals were really small. I just wanted it was this um local comedy club. I just wanted to be a weekend host there. So that was my main goal to just like host a show there on the weekends. And then I did that and then that club eventually closed. So then I started performing at this other club in the city. But then it was like I did everything I could do in Philly. I felt like I was just going in a circle. So that's when I decided, like, yeah, I need to move. I need to move to New York. And um, even with performing at the cellar, the people I perform with and the people that that know me, it blows my mind. Whereas, like, I'm trying my hard. I'm trying my hardest to, like, I have to remain professional because these are my coworkers. But at the same time, it's like, these are my heroes. <laughs> so... So I, I don't know how familiar you are with the Comedy Cellar. Um, it's like a back table there. The back table at the Comedy Cellar is um, it's like a spot just for the Comedy Cellar comedians to sit at. So you can't just walk in and say, I'm a comedian. Like, or like, and even comedians that might be well known around the city is like, okay, you might perform at this club, but you aren't past here. So it's like, you you can't hang there. So I remember like a few weeks ago, I'm sitting at the table and it's like me, a few other guys that are passed at the cellar, but then sitting with us is Chris Rock and Aziz. And that like that alone just blows my mind. Cause like for me, Chris, Chris Rock is one of the reasons that I do this. And then also to just like, so to be able to have a conversation with him and Aziz where like, these are like two legends in their own right. It's like it's the craziest thing. Like I can't, I can't imagine all like when I first did that talent show, I would have never imagined any of this. No, did you act? Were you successful in that talent show? Star now, like right off the bat, where you're like, oh, I um, got laughs. I'm gonna be good at this. No, well, I was funny, but at the same time, when I think about it, I mean, I was up there saying a bunch of nothing. Like it was more so because it was a school talent show. All my friends from school were there. And then the school I went to was about 15 minutes from where I grew grew up at. So I was also able to get like a good amount of my friends from home to come. So that was super easy. Then when I started going to the open mics and stuff in the city, I was I was good off the back. But also a thing that helped me was my age. I was so young. So I was 18. So being I was always the youngest at shows. So crowds were just always so eager to listen to me and give me a chance. Mm. Yeah. And do you take yeah. away, like, obviously comedy is so subjective in every sense. Like you could pull stuff from any mm-hmm. direction and make it funny. Do you, do you actually spend more time writing stuff out from things that you gather in your own head? Or do you take the experiences that you have in the walk of life? Is it a mixture of yeah. both? No, it's, it's definitely a, it's a mixture of both. I'm getting more comfortable I'm, I'm, uh, no, I, I have, I know, I know he was going to do this. My, I have my dog out. He hears people in the hallway. Um, Everyone loves dogs, man. <laughs> okay. No, but it's funny because the, the type of dog he is, like, he looks like a little teddy bear. So it's like him trying to like, what do, what do you think you're protecting? Um, <laughs> Same no, yeah. I have a four pound cockapoo that thinks that she could take down. That, that's exactly what I have. I have a, I have a cockapoo also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, but um, yeah, I, I try to, I, I'm mixing a good mixture of um, my experiences, but then also my opinions about things. One thing I, I learned from um, this comedian, Roy Wood Jr., his advice was always that like it really should be two types of jokes. One, um, one being either your experiences and the other one being like your opinion on something. And like anything else that's not like one of those two, you're just up there just trying to be funny, but you're not really saying much. And when you give your experiences and your real opinions, those are the things that make you um rememberable with people those are the things that uh take you from just being a a funny comedian 
to nail your household name or just somebody that people want to connect with and and learn more about always think about um like when when kevin hurt when he blew up on the scene one of the first things he that that took him to that next level was him making jokes about having a son and a daughter in his marriage and things like that when you get when you give insight to who you are these are the things that stick with people in the long run who would you say you know i mean you just mentioned kevin hart but who would you mm-hmm. say in today's game that's blown up when you talk about the Chappelle's, the birth yeah. sebastian maniscalco is one that i look mm-hmm. at that does a phenomenal job of right. yeah. people even with just his mannerisms and everything who mm-hmm. would you say that you look at and say like that's someone i'd want to like not like aspire to be or mimic after, but someone you look at and be like, that's a prime example of what I'm talking about. Like someone who can relate to an audience and get to a, to a level that no other comedians at. Um, yeah, I think for me, like right now, um, Kevin Hurt isn't my favorite, but I think he definitely has like in recent years have, has done it the best as far as, making himself super relatable to people i think which is like tough to do at his level because of how rich he is and how he lives such a different life than everybody know <laughs> but he still like has definitely found the way to to just speak about his his life and his newfound experiences and um and stay consistent with that so there's like one thing like that i definitely um try to aspire to to reach is that you know you talked about earlier about you know it's easy when you can look at yourself in the mirror writing down your jokes and thinking like Mm -hmm. oh this is funny this is gonna hit and then it doesn't once you're on stage do you you remember a specific time where like you thought you had a great set that was gonna kill and it just was underwhelming at least in your eyes yeah um i mean not that it happens it doesn't like now I'll bomb, but like my bombs are different now. So before a bomb would be the crowd didn't laugh or they didn't like me. Now my type of bomb is they like me, but it just wasn't the laugh that I wanted. Right. It just wasn't like that high laugh that I'm I'm used to getting. So um I say when I have underwhelming sets, the thing about that is though. The crowd doesn't know that you had a bad set unless you acknowledge it and let them know. So you could just keep going through your material and they and they won't really remember it. It's just the bomb really affects you more as a performer than it affects the crowd. So it was like now, because I get on stage so much, I just look at it. You have to kind of have short memory, short term memory with it. Like, OK, it was a bad set. All right. You move on to the next one. Mm, um, so it's more about you know you getting out of your own head when right yeah go your way don't let it yeah. affect you because then the crowd picks up on that they pick up on that vibe right yeah all of a sudden you're you're going downhill yeah but I definitely um I'm trying to think the last like really bad one I had um I guess now I'm more so comfortable where it's like I could I'm comfortable with if the jokes aren't hitting I'm comfortable with talking in the talking to the crowd and getting them to loosen up so that um just and that's one thing zoom comedy taught me before with i was so used to just doing regular stand-up i was just always in the pocket of my set yeah where now with zoom comedy you kind of have to be a little bit more conversational so that's definitely helped me as far as like just crowd work and maintaining engagement throughout my set and popping in popping in and out of a joke and talking to somebody in a crowd so that also helps with um i guess not bombing and just doing good because now with talking to them you're kind of getting them more on your side yeah i was gonna say like even like you were talking about before you know performing at a college or university you had like an hour set like Mm -hmm. just trying to remember all your stuff like if things aren't going your way or things are kind of going awry for a little bit you Mm -hmm. can just use crowd participation, interact with people, you know, Mm. just not as like a filler, but you know, obviously I think that helps, especially Mm -hmm. if you are, 
you know, like starting out if you're nervous or something, or if you, like you said, like forget some of your lines, some of the material that you came up with, like it's a nice little breather for you to have some time interact with the crowd, interact with some of the fans and then mm-hmm. get back on course. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I'm trying to think. I had a good point, and I just – I know it's, it's, it's going to come back to me. <laughs> it's definitely going to come back to me. Uh, yeah. No, I, I, I think that's, like, something – like, yeah. I've even seen it with open mic nights. Like, people mm-hmm. interacting with the crowd. I'm like, okay. Like, yeah. you're comfortable enough to where it's yeah. like, okay, this is going to come yeah. back around, and I'm able to – Oh, that, that's what I was going to say. It's kind of tricky, though, because – me, being comfortable with talking to the crowd and doing crowd work is something that just comes with time. Yeah. So I see now a lot of comedians, they start off trying to do it. And it's um, because they, they watch um, just great comics such as um, like Patrice O'Neill or Big J Okerson. These are guys that like have great crowd work, but at the same time, they've been doing comedy well over 20 years. So it was like, you're not just going to start out at an open mic just being on Patrice level. It took him years to get to the point where he could just go off the cuff like that and yeah. make everything seem so effortless. So that's the one thing um, I will say is like, um, you just have to let the crowd work and things like that come natural to you. Like, you'll just figure that out as you keep getting on stage. Oh, yeah, man. Do you, uh, I, I've noticed that you've done some, you know, film stuff, you know, like some short film work, and mm-hmm. stuff. like it's, you know, acting, not like acting, acting, but, you know, right. you know, like Kevin Hart obviously took his comedy career, transformed that and what he's doing now. Obviously, mm-hmm. he's got podcasts, he's got, you know, big time movie roles, but then you look right. at someone as young as like a Trevor Wallace, who's just like on YouTube making videos and stuff like right. that. Is that something that you want to pursue moving forward? Or? No, no, definitely. That. De- that's like one of my main goals for this year. So prior to the pandemic, I was reaching out to a few agents about, um, cause I'm like right now, everything I've been doing, like I have a college agent, but I need just um like some for TV and film and yeah. just things of that sort. So I could get those types of auditions. So I was reaching out and I had, I was in talking to a few about setting up some meetings um and everything just like fell through pandemic um and then also other ones they just didn't keep they just didn't show the level of interest that I wanted right so that's um the main thing where it's like I do want to I do want to audition and act but I want everything to be the right fit for me I want things to be right for me outside of um like business wise before I do get into that that next level, because um, it's just like now I'm at a point where it's like I know exactly what I want out of my career, so I'm glad like things are happening now for me. I'm glad I got into comedy so young. So because so February this February I make it eleven years for me that I've been doing comedy. I'm um and I'm 29, so it's like I still have some youth on my side. Um. But I've been in situations where I had a manager try to represent me or a certain agent try to represent me. And they were trying to put me in a box that I just I felt like I didn't fit that mold. So I know now, like with the people that I am going to talk to about, like maybe representing me, I know how to go into that situation saying, hey, this is exactly what I want for myself. And I feel like this is what I could bring to the table. That's definitely the tricky part about, you know, hooking up business wise with an agent or someone, you know, even writers like you, you probably right. put stuff down and it looks great on paper, but then you bring a team together to try to shoot it or produce it. And everybody's mm-hmm. got their own opinions. Everybody's got their own idea of what it could look right. like. And all of a sudden it just like, doesn't turn out the way it did in your head. Mm-hmm. Or should it? it almost never does. <laughs> but I feel like that's almost the most frustrating thing about the film industry alone, you know, put comedy aside, right. you know, like you have a great idea, but then, you know, someone else takes it and flips it and right. you, just, and you can't shoot it alone, you know? So it's like, you kind of have to like, at least talk to people, kind of explain what you want. But at the end of the day, like never turns out the way that you, you'd you imagine. Sometimes it turns right. out way better, but sometimes right. for now it's like, this, this isn't working. Right. Yeah. Cause like, it's just, I've, I've went through certain experience with, um, 
just I mean, just in all different aspect, aspects of comedy, where it's like I know exactly what I'm looking for now. So, like, for example, one of the things I did um, last year, I was doing a podcast with one of my friends. He asked me to, um, if I wanted to co-host with him. And even with doing that, I saw I felt like because it was his, it was like, I don't want to change this too much. But we just had two different visions. Yeah. So, like, that's why I kind of stepped away from it, because it's just like now like I'm I'm growing into my voice and I just know what I want out of certain situations. Mm. Mm. Do you always take something away from a set or are there times where you're just like rolling, not like in cruise control, but you're just rolling from, you know, set to set, city to city, opening up um, people like I try I try I do try to take away like um from like from every set, but it's just so hard because it's just so many. And then sometimes, so now, like with performing in New York, because I'm I'm usually getting on stage multiple times a night, I really only like to do. Um, I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I will take all the bookings that I can, but once you get past like that third or fourth set of the night, you're kind of just like mentally fatigued. Yeah. Whereas, like, I'm just. I've had moments where it's like I'm just on stage going through the motions where it's like they're laughing, but it's like I'm almost like just like like you said, on cruise control, where it's where I've had moments where I've I legit had to ask the crowd, hey, I didn't do this one already, right? <laughs> or like I didn't talk about this one. I didn't talk about this with you. Like like I've literally just had to ask that just because it's like I I did shows. I'm trying to think like so the the main club that I work in New York they have four venues on the same block and there's been times where it's like I've literally I've got off stage at one show then I I did their venue downstairs then I got off I went around the corner did their corner did their like did did the one room and then got off stage there and I did their next room so I've had times where it's like I literally I did four sets did four, did four 15 minute sets in a span of an hour and a half. <laughs> Man. So, yeah. So it's like, I'm like, so and with performing it for these four different crowds, it's like, you kind of get caught up. Like, okay, I hope I didn't do this tag with them already. Or I hope I didn't mention this with them. Cause at the same, like I, I do have different jokes, but you might be in a loop of you might just want to tighten up a certain joke or work on a, a specific set because you might have a taping or something coming up. Mm. So, yeah. Man, do you have, a sp- and I know you probably do, mm-hmm. even if you can't remember it off the top of your head, which is kind of a weird way to phrase it. But do you, do you mm. remember one joke that just hit amongst everything else in your career, at least starting out? Mm-hmm. Like starting out like you're probably bombing more than you're hitting but then you finally found yeah. that one groove yeah um i say for me um man yeah yeah i say for me one of my first jokes like that um that really hit was like before i was just talking about like random stuff just trying to be like just funny on any topic but then once i started digging to once i started really digging into my college experience those jokes would hit so hard and because i have that college experience that's what makes it so easy for me to perform at colleges on the road so um so that i would say that that would um that's what like let me know like i could really turn my life into funny jokes like into funny situations that um my barber joke um that one like just i remember like the whole development of that joke specifically because before i the way i used to do my barber joke i would say men are more faithful to their barbers than they are to their like girlfriends right but when i came up like when i was doing that premise i was thinking like this is something like easy that one anybody could take anybody could just take that um and do it as their own but then there's also just a real simple concept that i've heard other people say 
So I was like, how can I build this into a, a full story that no, that if somebody was to try to steal it or duplicate it, people would know it came from me. So with that situation, that's when like, that let me know, like I could legit have a career at this. Man, that, yeah. I, I always love hearing people's stories about how when they figured out not only like when this was something that they were going to pursue full time, but at the same time knew like it's going to happen one day. Like it has right, to, yeah. because like you've manifested it. Now you've realized like, okay, people are invested. People are listening to you. Like it, mm-hmm. you feel like, I don't want to say powerful or controlling up there, but like when you have the mic in your hand, you kind of have the crowd in your hand too. Everybody. Oh, it's amazing. Like, and that's like the level of confidence I have now. I'm just like on a whole nother different level. Like, and I've been telling my friends this lately, like, it's like, I, I really got back in my groove, whereas I'm just so comfortable um, because a lot of people, of course, you you love the laughter, but what I really enjoy is, like, when I could turn a rowdy crowd around and just have them in my hand where they're completely silent. And because I, I had posted a video, I had posted a clip. And um, I posted a video and somebody even pointed that out, that out. And that's what made me feel good that somebody else noticed that somebody was like, man, the way you have them, like just completely listening is amazing. And and that's what I really enjoy, because as comedians, when you first start off, comedians usually tend to speed through the material because you think you have to have them constantly laughing. But when you get comfortable with the silence, that's when your punchlines, that's when they hit so different because sometimes they're just listening to that story. So learning how to take the crowd along their journey with me is just such an amazing feeling. How how much do you look back at like some of like your early open mic nights or, you know, doing 15 yeah. minutes at a club when you take away what you just said, you know, going from yeah. starting from trying to make yeah. everybody laugh with everything that you said to setting up a story to where when the punchline yeah. hits, it's like out of nowhere. Yeah. People weren't expecting. I know, like, I think about it now and I think like I was good back then, but I mean, I cringe when I watch those sets. <laughs> Like I cringe, like when I watch those sets and listen to that audio, I'm like, oh, like I got, this could have been so much better. Like I, I was just not even realizing that I was selling myself short by not just pacing myself a little bit more and taking my time. Who? Last question for you. I don't want to take up all yeah, of no your problem. Wednesday, but <laughs> I know your dog's yeah. probably waiting too. <laughs> Actually, I pulled up a picture of my dog. Okay, matter of fact, it's like my little teddy bear. Yeah, he's over there asleep. I, I <laughs> already, yeah. already yeah. That's, that's, that's that's all he does. Like I'm actually surprised that he's doing this great throughout this because he's usually going crazy. So yeah, this is him. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It could be siblings. Right. Yeah. How how old is your dog? So. Uh she's ten, I believe. Oh oh wow, he's one. Um. Really? Yeah. 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 Like he turns. Oh, he turns one. He turns one in a few weeks. I think my dog's probably gained around yeah. four pounds in the last decade. Mm. Like he. This. This is my first dog too. This is really? my first time ever having a dog, and it's amazing. Like I never would have imagined being a dog person, and I tell people this all the time. Like, um, even with with watching John Wick. Like, so I watched John Wick prior to having a dog. So when you watch it, like, why did he snap like this? Right. Now watching it and being a dog owner is like, he had to kill everybody. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, they definitely deserved it. <laughs> uh, it's like yeah. having a kid. It really is. Yeah, I mean, it really yeah. is. For like you guys that don't have children, it's yeah. like having a child. Like, I literally, when I put him away, I, if I'm, when I put him in his crate and if I'm going out, it's like I literally have to run away from the door so I don't hear him crying for me. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Dude, well, I'll, I'll let you get back to him as soon as possible. Give him a nice back yeah. during his <laughs> half of the day. But I wanted to ask you again, like with everything that you've accomplished at this point, with all the people mm-hmm. that you've gotten to share the stage with, is there anyone in particular that you watched either growing up or watching now that you'd love to tour with or at least very most share the stage yeah. with? Um that I would want to tour with, 
I would definitely want to tour with um with Kevin Hart. I would want to, but I know like the chances of that is just like he's he has his set crew that he's been rolling with ever since before he blew up. So the guys that are open for him now at arenas they've been opening for him when he was just doing one-nighters at small comedy clubs so but that is like eventually because i i know the guys that that open for him and i know eventually they're going to want to break off and do their own tour so i definitely do want to um would love to open for him and even i mean he's seen me he vouches for me right um like literally um <laughs> uh this was like in November. In November he was out here doing press for his um Netflix show and um he had me do some time before him at the comedy cellar. He had so like yeah, ex could they put put me on before him. And um and like jokingly he was like, Yeah, you better not bomb <laughs> after I vouch for you. Um but like yeah, it was like I had a great set and like he really enjoyed it. So that's definitely I would definitely love to um like just tour with him. And like he just gives me such great advice. Oh my god, I, I couldn't imagine. And like now that you kinda have an opportunity to go any which direction, like is there a specific city that you think would be the best city to perform in, or do you think New York City, Philadelphia, East Coast in general, I think um is better than anything you're gonna get out west? No, no, no. I definitely want to come to the West Coast. I definitely, like, I hear so many um great comedy. Like, of course, I want to get to L.A. I want to do Vegas. That's my goal. Like, I want to do Vegas um sometime this year, too. And I hear, I think it's a club in Phoenix. Stand Up Live. Stand up, like, yeah, I hear Stand great Up room. Live is amazing. It's a great room. Everybody I was there this got... past weekend just kicking it. it. It was awesome. Okay. Are you, are you in Phoenix? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I know um everybody that I know that like works there, they say it's a great room. It's so unbelievable. Yeah, I great definitely crowd. want to get out great there. Crowd. They had a great um Trevor Wallace was headlining, had a bunch of great guys, Chappelle Lacey, uh Michael uh Blaustein was there. Just oh, okay. a great, great crowd, great comedians as well. Yeah, I mean everybody says I think Rogan just said it with a comedian the other day that Stand Up Live is one of the best rooms out there, which is mm. crazy. I mean, it's a great setup, great place right in downtown Phoenix. Right. <laughs> it's definitely one of the better ones. I, I still have to make, I'm originally from New Jersey, lived right outside Manhattan the first 18 years of what, my life. I've never been. What part of Jersey? Uh, Morristown, New Jersey. Morristown. Okay. Yeah, I'm in, um, I'm in Jersey City now. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I was in, um, so I'm from Philly. I lived there up until i was 22 then i moved to brooklyn and i was in brooklyn from 2015 until when did i move i moved right in the middle of the pandemic i moved to jersey city i got a i got me a great covid deal i moved out here in september of 2020 do you like jersey city i love it really like it's, it's it's so crazy how much i love jersey now like now that i live out here I can't ever see myself living back in, in New York. Like I used to always tell oh. myself, like, once I get money, I want to get me a, a nice apartment in the city. No, like not like just being able to go to a dog park or drive to all the different malls out here. I love Jersey. Jersey is the butt of all jokes in New York City until you get there and you're like, oh my right. God, it's right. so spread out. People are a right. little bit nicer. Right. That's what's crazy. It's like Philly, I mean. Jersey catches hell from, like, North Jersey catches hell from New York and South Jersey catches hell from Philly. But, like, once you actually, like, you're here, it's like, oh, this is so much more peaceful. <laughs> you actually go into, like, a, a shop, right, and be like, oh, my God, there's space here. I can actually right, yeah. without bumping into people. Right, yeah. It's insane. Are you performing in Jersey City anytime soon? Yeah, I'm actually performing in, um. well, I'm actually doing a show out here tomorrow. So, to. Where am I? Tonight, tonight I'm in Brooklyn. Tomorrow I'm in Jersey City. Friday I'm at the cellar. And um, yeah, so I kind of just bounce around mostly, but like during throughout the week, I'm mostly in between um New York and Jersey. And then uh I'm I'm gonna try to start going back on the road 
more so um, the spring and the summer. Well, you got a lot of gigs coming up, man. Where where can we follow you on social media to close this thing out? On social media, at all that and more on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. Um, do I have any other apps? I think that's it. You, my YouTube is um as also all that and more at ENT. And yeah, I think that's it. You got a lot going on. You got a lot coming. I hope to see you uh, in the film game more. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's. That's I'm definitely going to be watching out. Mm.